All right, my plan, guys, I uh, sent an email a little bit ago. Uh, we're going to have a Chapter 4 test on Friday. All right, so from now to then, we're going to uh, kind of wrap up all loose ends of Chapter 4, which we're, we're pretty close to, to doing in the next day or so. Um, and then it will be just a, a practice of going through um, different styles of problems uh, that address the material uh, so far. So. Uh, almost done with Chapter 4. Uh, my hopes are to uh, buy Christmas break to uh, to speed through at least get halfway through Chapter 6, if not all the way through Chapter 6. So we got two chapters to cover uh, and uh, about 16 or 17 uh, school days. Um, today I'll be talking about isosceles triangle theorem. Okay, and uh, identifying some vocabulary that we always use with isosceles triangles. And then kind of the uh, the fallout theorems that that come from uh, using triangle congruencies, okay? Inside a tri an isosceles triangle. So um, four or five isosceles triangle theorems will be two theorems we talked about today. Uh, before we get to those, we need to kind of revisit what an isosceles triangle is. Does anybody know what an isosceles triangle is? Down. A triangle where two sides are equal. That is great. That is awesome. But I would say there's a problem with that. When you say there, when it has two sides that are equal, are you telling me that a triangle with three equal sides is not isosceles, or would it be isosceles? A triangle with three sides congruent is still going to have all the criteria that isosceles triangles need or have. Okay. So at least two sides. That's what we want to make sure we have in, in our in our uh, definition. Okay. So an isosceles triangle is a triangle that has at least two congruent sides, meaning it could have three. Okay. When it does have three, we still want to classify it as isosceles. Okay. And understand that it has those features of isosceles. But a lot of times we like to be more specific and be able to talk about it differently. So we call it equilateral. Okay. And that gets us. The, to ask the question, is an equilateral triangle isosceles? And once we answer that, we're going to reverse and say, is an isosceles triangle equilateral? Okay? And, and we're going to answer these based off their definition. Okay? An equilateral triangle is a triangle where all three sides are equal. An isosceles triangle is a triangle with at least two sides equal. Okay? So let me type this out real quick so you guys can see the, the definitions here. Okay, so um, definition of equilateral triangle would be all three sides congruent. Okay, definition of isosceles at least two sides congruent. Okay, so my question is if you have an isosceles all you know is that the triangle in front of you is isosceles. Okay, put in your hands a triangle. And I tell you, I tell you, all you know about it is it's isosceles. Based off the definition, can it be equilateral? Uh, let, me, let me phrase it this way. So in front of you, I'm telling you, it's isosceles. Bare minimum, it's isosceles. Let's just say it has two congruent sides. Okay? That's all you know. Is it possible that it could be equilateral? If you have an isosceles triangle with only two sides congruent, is it possible to be equilateral? No. Because it doesn't meet the fact of being having three sides congruent, right? Now, if I tell you you have an isosceles triangle in front of you, but I tell you nothing about the three sides, could it potentially be equilateral? Yes. Okay, so an isosceles triangle is sometimes equilateral. If I know something about that third side, does that make sense? Okay, let's reverse. Let's say in front of you, you have an equilateral triangle. If I tell you in front of you, in your hands, you have an equilateral triangle, you now know something about all three sides. They're all the same, right? Is that then also isosceles? Yeah, because when it's equilateral, it meets that 
definition on its way to being equilateral. Does that make sense? Okay. You're going to hear questions like this all the time. You've heard them before. Is a uh, square a rectangle or a rectangle square? You've heard that phrase before, right? Some people have trouble answering that question. Okay. You guys remember last year we talked about polynomial? You remember hearing that word? Okay. Uh, and within polynomials, you heard words like monomial and binomial, right? Okay. A binomial is a polynomial. Does that make sense? But every polynomial is not a binomial. Is that right with everybody? Kind of understand that link? Okay. Because this, I'm going to tap that. So last year, this is a polynomial, x squared plus 3x plus 5. Okay. This is a binomial, x plus 2. If I gave you this, you could call it a polynomial. Okay. Because poly just means many and nomial means term, right? Many terms. Okay. But if I told it, so I gave you this, you could call it a polynomial. Okay. So a binomial is a polynomial. But if I gave you a polynomial, so in front of you is a polynomial, you had your eyes closed, can you tell me that it's a binomial or not? Just by having a, just knowing there's a polynomial in front of you on your paper, can you tell me how many terms it has by not looking at it? No. So you can't classify it as a binomial, trinomial, or anything. All you can say is a polynomial, right? Does that make sense? So when we're classifying things, like isosceles, is it equilateral, or is it equilateral isosceles, we have to do that against their definition. Okay? Uh, and knowing our definitions is going to be very useful uh, when we start asking these questions of, you know, true or false, or always, sometimes, never, uh, in regards to these things. Okay? So what the reason I'm talking about that is that phrase right there. Every time that we learn something true about an isosceles triangle, we can carry that over, and it's going to be true for an equilateral triangle. Because every equilateral is isosceles. Does that make sense? But on the contrary of that, every time I learn something for an equilateral triangle, a fact about equilateral triangles, can I carry that over to an isosceles and say it's true for all isosceles? No. Okay? And that's what I want to make sure we understand. Okay? Everything that is true for isosceles is also true for equilateral. But everything that's true for equilateral is not true for isosceles. Okay? So you got to keep that in mind. You got to justify that to yourself. And it's based off those definitions. Here's some vocabulary that we want to use um, to talk about isosceles triangles. Okay? So. The first one is the congruent side, okay? And by definition, we said it's a, it's a triangle has at least two congruent sides, so that's what we're going to start with. It's the bare minimum, two congruent sides. That set of congruent sides we refer to as the leg, okay? Uh, so a lot of the work that we do with isosceles triangle is looking at the bare minimum requirement to be isosceles, so two congruent sides. So we call those the legs, all right? The legs come together to make an end. We call that the vertex angle. Very, very important angle. Okay? Uh, we'll talk about that all. Pretty much this, this isosceles triangle stuff right now is setting the, the precedent for a lot of things that we are going to cover through the rest of the year. Okay? Um, we, we'll see a corollary here in a little bit. We talked about it already once, um, but we'll talk about it in great detail in the next couple of days. It becomes one of the most dominating corollaries or theorems for the rest of the course. Okay? Uh, and it uses these words like vertex angle and base angle and stuff like that. So we've got the vertex angle. It's where the, the legs come together to make an angle. Okay. Now, the, the side that is incongruent to the other two sides, so that green side, that we call it the base, okay, it is the side of the isosceles triangle that is non-congruent or incongruent to the other two sides. Okay. It's the one that's different. The angles that are formed with a leg and a base are referred to as base angles. There's going to be some use um, of that, that term base angles as we start to see some theorems here in a little bit. Now, 
we can start talking about these things. Like I said, uh, this is the kind of the bare minimum requirement to be isosceles. We can still have those components inside an equilateral triangle. I know my picture doesn't maybe look like it's equilateral, but let's do this. Okay. Um, I can still talk about these two sides as being legs if I wanted to. Okay, so if those two sides are legs, A would be the vertex angles, and it uh, B and C would be the base angles, and BC would be the base. Okay, if I wanted to talk about these two sides as being the legs, then would B be the vertex angle? AC would be the base, and angle A and angle C would be the base angle. I can then do the same thing here and say these two are the legs. This would be the vertex angle. Okay, so this would be the base, and A and B would be the base angle. But we can do that with a um, an equilateral triangle. It's just going to you've got to identify which ones you want to refer to as your legs, and then that will then dictate what you're going to call your vertex angle, what you call your base angle. Okay. Uh, we're going to find out some relationships between uh, all those angles uh, here in a little bit as well. All right, so that brings us, once we've got the vocabulary kind of understood, it brings us to our first theorem. It's called the isosceles triangle theorem. It says if two sides of a triangle are congruent, okay? So if two sides of a triangle are congruent, what are they telling you you have there in that if statement? What shape is being presented to you? You know, a triangle has two congruent sides, it's a... That if part, guys, you're telling me I have an isosceles triangle, right? Okay. So you might see this theorem written at some point. Um, if it's an isosceles triangle, then the angles opposite those sides are congruent. Okay. Well, what do we call those angles opposite segment AB and segment AC? What do we call angle B and angle C from our picture that we, we saw in the last slide? Same thing. Okay, so that phrase right there, angles opposite, might be referred to as base angle. Okay, so I just want to give you different ways that you might see this theorem right now. This is one of the theorems that, uh, in the proof that accompanies it, is one of the things that the NFCOS exam likes to target or has targeted in the last two, three years. Okay, um, so if two sides of a triangle are congruent and the angles opposite those sides are also congruent, Okay. Or you might see them say, if it is an isosceles triangle, then base angles are congruent. Okay. I like that phrasing because it's more concise, it's, it's, it's less writing. Okay. Um, but then we have to know our, our vocabulary a little bit better. Okay. Um, so, we want to prove this. Okay. So we prove this, and I'm going to, I'm going to kind of adjust uh, what I've got written down uh, so far in my proof. So give me a moment here in a minute. Um, but if I want to prove that theorem, the given is the if part, right? The given is that you have an isosceles triangle. So we're going to start off with uh, triangle ABC is isosceles, and we'll have to add that we know that BC is the base, okay? Um, just so we can structure our picture correctly, okay? The prove is the then part. So we're trying to prove then that base angles, which in this case would be angle B and angle C, we're trying to prove those congruent. Okay? So as we write our given you know, our proof, this will, this will be how we, we start our proof off. You can write this down. The given triangle ABC is isosceles with base BC proven that angle B is congruent to angle C. That's what we're going to start off with. So let you write that down, and I'm going to fix my statement here.
All right, so that, so just telling you with base BC is, is, is ultimately telling me which size that I want to use uh, that definition of my software is with. Okay, it's basically telling me that AB and AC are my two room sizes. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, if you want to use a different base, by all means, go ahead and use a different base. Okay. Um, write my given down triangle ABC. Is isosceles with base BC. Okay. Now, what that does for me, and this is going to be something that you guys see a lot uh, as we work through more proofs. Now that we, we have this vocabulary word isosceles, isosceles is always going to give us some congruent parts. Okay. So, one set of congruent parts that we get from isosceles is, by the definition, because it's a vocabulary word, right, is that two sides of your triangle should be congruent. Because we know that base is BC, then that defaults the other two sides as AB and AC to be the leg. And those are the parts in an isosceles triangle that are congruent. I'm going to say definition of isosceles triangle. AB is congruent to AC. All right, so that's nice. The next thing that we want to do, guys, is, is we're trying to use triangle congruency to lead us to new information. And right now, we don't have multiple triangles. We only have one triangle up there, right? So what we want to do is we want to use an auxiliary line. We want to use an extra line because we can draw in as many extra lines as we want to. Because we know all it takes is two points, right? And, and we've got a lot of points in this triangle. We've got, obviously, the three vertices. But there's an infinite number of points on these sides, right? We just highlight any two that we want to, and we can connect them and create an auxiliary line. But there's one useful one, okay? If I look at angle BAC, angle BAC, does every single angle have an angle bisector. Every single angle that you ever come across has an angle bisector. We agree with that? So I'm going to say construct or draw. Use the word draw to see you right. Draw AD, segment AD, so that it bisects. Angle BAC. Well, this might be a statement that you guys initially kind of need to be shown a couple times. Okay? Um, not all that obvious to use it. Okay? Now, when I draw an angle bisector, it keeps going on forever, right? But it's going to eventually intersect BC. Wouldn't you agree with that? Well, the point that it intersects BC is that's the point D that I'm referring to. Okay? So I was going to draw that portion of it. And I think you guys can argue, you can, you can justify, maybe we haven't talked about this as a theorem or a property or anything like that, but every angle can be divided by two, right? Every angle can be cut in half. Um, so I'm going to write here every angle has a bisect. Okay? kind of an existence thing, okay? We know it should exist. We know it should be there. Let's conveniently draw that one. In. Let's, let's highlight that one that I think is the angle bisector, okay? Well, angle bisector, guys, that's a vocabulary word, isn't it? And if I were to look in the back of a book, it's going to tell me it's the, it's the ray or the segment or the line that takes an angle and cuts it into two what? To congruent angle. Okay? So if, I, if I'm taking the angle bisector of BAC, 
What does that mean that angle BAD is congruent to angle CAD? Be that angle there, that's BAD, and that would be CAD, right? Is that okay, everybody? That would be the definition of an angle bisect. All right, so kind of think about what we've been doing. We've been showing triangles congruent, okay, by showing some congruencies of parts in both triangles. And right now, that's what we got to have in front. We have two triangles up there, okay. We have two parts of the triangle on the left, congruent to two parts of the triangle on the right. Is there a third part that I'm aware of that I know should be congruent? AD can grow into itself. Okay. So step five, AD is congruent to AD. Reflect this property. Now look at your triangle on the left here. Like just look at that triangle. What are the order of parts that you have highlighted up there as being congruent? Side angle side. Okay. Do I have do I have the same ordering of parts on the triangle on the right? Okay. So tell me about those two triangles. They're congruent. Okay. So I'm gonna say step six. Six triangle BAD is congruent with the triangle CAD. By the order of those parts, so it's side angle side. And that's not what we set out to prove, okay, but we're getting closer. If I have the triangles congruent, if I have the triangles congruent, then doesn't that mean the parts that I have not mentioned throughout the entire proof that correspond to one another? For instance, B and C. Would those parts correspond? Okay? If we look at our picture, are those parts the base angle? Okay. So can I say step seven? That angle B is congruent to angle C. My reason would be C, P, C, C, C. Corresponding parts of your triangles are congruent. Once you show the triangles congruent, the parts that you have not talked about that are corresponding in position have to be congruent as well. Okay? And now, if you think about what we start off with, okay? We started off with the fact that this triangle was isosceles. We start off with that information right there. And what we just came up with then is that that angle B and that angle C are congruent. And those were our base angles, right? So the facts that we learned throughout this course about triangles and eventually about quadrilaterals and special quadrilaterals like parallelograms and things that we learned about pentagons and even circles eventually, that information is going to be generated most of the time because of triangles and the relationship that we show by tr proving two triangles congruent. Okay. Um, so the I thought we'll call the isosceles triangle theorem is a result of two congruent triangles. Okay. Um, now this red step here, the second red step right here, uh, number three, that is something that I think you have to get accustomed to. You have to see it a couple times uh, before you know that you can use it. Okay. Um, I don't think that's extremely obvious, especially if we go off the kind of the seven steps that I gave you. Uh, at the beginning uh, of our proof work, uh, none of those steps are really addressed, uh, number three there. Okay? But we do know that that segment exists or that uh, that angle bisector exists, so it would be, be useful to, to have that. Okay. So now here's my question. Are there any other things or is there anything else uh, that would be kind of a product of this? We now know those two triangles are right? 
Okay. So what's that tell me about point D for that segment BC? What would point D have been? It'd be a midpoint. Okay. Now the reason it's a midpoint, think about this. B D corresponds to C D, doesn't it? Okay. Well, B D is that segment. C D is that segment. If those two things are congruent, then D has to be smack dab in the middle of B and C, right? So it has to be a midpoint. That's cool. All right, here's another thing. What has to be true about angle ADB? So A to D to B. Start in the middle, go to the point on the right, finish at the first point, first left. How does that relate to ADC? So ADB would be that angle right there. Um, ADC would be that angle right there. They correspond, right? Based off their name. So they should be congruent, correct? Okay. They're congruent. But what do they form here? What kind, of, what kind of angle is that that they form from B to D to C? That's a Brooklyn L. And angle is this? I have that. Here's B, here's D, here's C. These two angles as a group or the pair are a linear pair, right? Linear pairs are not congruent, supplementary. Okay? So these two angles, these two blue angles need to be supplementary. They need to be adding a 180. Well, if they're both the same, what do they both have to be? 90. So now, I can actually draw this in instead. Okay. So what does that do for us? Okay. Well, let's think back to what this segment here was, the way we referred to that. We said that, that segment was a bisector of angle BAC, right? Well, BAC, just go back to our vocabulary, Say BAC is the angle that is stuck between your two legs, right? Well, the angle that's stuck between the two legs is the vertex angle. So that yellow or red ray, whatever, you want, whatever color you want to refer to it as right now, that ray is the bisector of the vertex angle. We find out then that it is also then perpendicular to the base at the base's midpoint, isn't it? Okay. And all of that information flows or stems from CPCTC and showing these triangles congruent. So what I want you guys to know, I want you to write down here, okay? These three statements here, but the, the, the first one I want you to write down is that bottom one, okay? Because that's the one that uh, we just discussed. And, and the, the statement that's written in black is just a different way of saying the statement that's written in red. I like the one that's written in red. It's more concise, okay? Um, but we need to know more, more vocabulary to, to kind of understand that one. This is the bisector of the vertex angle. That was that red line that I highlighted yellow. Okay? So the bisector of the vertex angle in an isosceles triangle is perpendicular to the base at the base's midpoint. That is, if we were to kind of go through all the problems that we're going to see from here to the end of the year, and we just kept tally of the theorem or the corollaries that are used the most in the problems that we see from here to the end of the year, this one's going to show up the most. Okay? It is one that we need to make sure that we burn into our minds and we're, we're, we're going to use it all the time. Okay? The bisect of the vertex angle and isosceles triangle is perpendicular to the base at its midpoint. Another way of saying perpendicular to the base at its midpoint, well, if I'm perpendicular to something at something's midpoint, okay, that means it's a perpendicular bisect. All right? So that red phrase is saying the same thing, the bisector of the vertex angle is the perpendicular bisector of the base. Say the same thing with less words. And it's all because of CPCTC after I've shown those two triangles in a row. The other corollaries that are, that are pretty useful um, 
that follow from that theorem uh, with a little bit of a uh, kind of an addendum to that, to that um, proof, okay, uh, is to maybe make the proof so that my, my isosceles triangle is in fact equilateral, okay, um, and if it's equilateral, basically go through and do that proof two times and prove then that all three angles are congruent, okay, so if it's equilateral, it's also equilangular. So, here's kind of my argument to show you how you would, I'm not going to do it, it's kind of a, a long process. I wanted to show that statement right there. The way I would do it, if it's equilateral, obviously we're going to start with all of these sides congruent, right? Okay. I would focus initially on working with those two. Well, let me use this color. I would focus on that purple set of sides to be congruent. If those purple sets of sides are congruent, could we walk through the proof and show us that angle there and that angle there are congruent? Does that make sense? That's, just, that's exactly what we just did. The next thing I would do is with the exact same triangle, I would choose two different legs. So maybe I would choose that leg there and that leg there. And now the angle bisector would be kind of that one there. Does that make sense? But what that would eventually lead me to is the fact that that angle there and that angle there are congruent. Does that make sense? So let me go through and name these angles. We have this, I think, called this one A, B, C. This again would have been A, B, and C. Here, I would have figured out that angle B is congruent to angle C, right? Over here, I would figure out that angle A is congruent to angle C. Well, if B is congruent to C, but C is congruent to A, what's that tell you about B compared to A? B is to C, but C goes to A. Isn't B congruent to A as well? So do you have now the link that all three of these angles are congruent? Does that make sense to everybody? So when you start off with an equilateral triangle, you develop an equilangular triangle. We get that connection, okay? And that would be the transit property uh, kind of allowing for that to, to occur. Something that comes from that, then, how many degrees are there in a triangle? 180. If it's equilangular, then 180 divided by 3 can only give you 60, right? So each angle is going to be 60 degrees, okay? Uh, and if it's equilangular, it's also equilateral, so then we say equilateral triangles have 60 degree angles. All right. So those are some, some properties that follow directly from the theorem of isosceles, of the isosceles triangle theorem. Okay. That the, the base angles of an isosceles triangle are congruent. Okay. Um, now, we like to reverse that and I'm not going to do the proof with you, but the converse is indeed true, okay? And it's because of the same idea. We're going to be able to take our, our isosceles triangle, divide it into two triangles, and show that those two triangles are congruent somehow, okay? Um, but what that's going to lead us to is if two angles of a triangle are congruent, then the sides opposite those angles are congruent, okay? If two angles of a triangle are congruent, then the sides opposite those angles are congruent. So in chapter two, we talked about how if you have a theorem and it's converse and they're both true, you write them as biconditionals. So those would be two biconditionals that you could write using these two theorems. Okay? So the triangle is isosceles. So basically, you know two sides to be congruent if and only if the base angles are congruent. And that allows you to read that forwards and backwards. So if I read that forwards and backwards, read it backwards now. It says 
base angles are congruent if and only if you have a triangle that's isosceles, or if and only if you have two sides that are congruent. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Um, so these are two uh, theorems that we can reverse. You know, inherently we want to see a statement and read it and, and, and reverse it in mathematics a lot of times. Okay. This is one that you can do that with. Okay. That's something we can do. All right, so these two, this is all we're doing. You just look at a triangle, it's like, okay, we got two sides here, and now what two angles are congruent? Or I look at a triangle, I got two angles here, and now I got to decide what two sides are congruent. Okay? Um, if I can look and, and find opposite sides and opposite angles, this should be a pretty easy process. Okay? Um, so I want to do a couple examples. Okay, I'll skip over these boring examples. I think you guys can get through those uh, kind of on your own. Something like this, okay? Kind of a, it's an elementary question, but what they're going to ask you to do is they find the measure of angle X. And a lot of people right away want to say it's 70 degrees. What is 70 degrees up there? What angle should be 70 degrees? Y and what else? Z, right? The angle opposite the congruent side should be the same, okay? So we get Z to be 70. Now angle X has to be what? 40, okay? So a lot of times they're not going to let you answer with the most simplistic answer. Does that make sense? Okay? Uh, or the most obvious answer. They're going to make you work through a little bit, um, kind of using other properties, other theorems, that kind of thing, uh, in, in conjunction with uh, the isosceles triangle theorem. Uh, what about this? So, so a lot of times what they're going to do, and they won't necessarily give me I don't want to give you the right angle. Oops. I want to give you I want to give you that information. And I want to ask you what that measurement is right there. Okay. Um, now, if I gave you the right angle right away, I think it's pretty easy, 65, 90, and then we find that angle, right? Okay. Um, so they'll do this. So they'll give you this overall blue triangle of isosceles. So if it's isosceles, what is angle C? 65, right? That's the base angle. Um, so that's nice. Okay. Now, the other thing they start to do okay, is because of that congruency in that one, what do you know D to be? D is a midpoint, okay? And it's a midpoint of the base, isn't it? When you have a segment, this will, this will be angle ABC is the what angle for my, for my isosceles triangle? The vertex angle, okay? When you have a segment, that starts at the vertex angle, and it goes to the midpoint of the base. It's perpendicular. That's that theorem that uh, the angle bisector of the vertex angle is the perpendicular bisector of the base. That's actually a reversible statement. Okay. Um, so now, if that's the case, now you gain 90 degrees here, 65, 65. You should know that that angle there is 50, right? Does that make sense? 180 degrees in the triangle. We got 130 so far. So that's 50. If this is the, if this is a, a segment that is going from the vertex angle to the midpoint of the base and perpendicular to the base, doesn't it cut that 50 in half and give you 25 right there? Okay. Um, what, what I need you guys to understand with isosceles triangles, if at any time, I'm going to start over with this, this bland isosceles triangle, if at any time that you get a right angle right there, you automatically get that congruency and that congruency. Does that make sense? Okay. Anytime that I start with that congruency, I automatically get right angle and I get that congruency. Or anytime that I start with um, this congruency, and I'll get those right angles, 
and I'll get those congruency. Does that make sense? So whenever I get one of those three pieces of information, the other two should follow from it. Okay? Uh, it's very, very important to, to a lot of the work that we do with isosceles triangles. Um, all right, let's go to this um, more algebraic type problem. Okay? What am I going to do here? What is, what is the relationship between those two uh, expressions? That should be what going on? 7x minus 10 equals 3x plus 6. Okay? So just like anything else we've done throughout the entire year so far, right? We learn a property that says this develops congruency or equality, and then we start seeing problems that allow us to generate equations, and we solve those equations. Okay? I'll let you solve that, but it gives you x to be 4. Um, now you might see problems like this where we have to carry some value. Okay? Um, and, and, and some properties that we talked about in the past might be present here. Okay? Uh, we have two isosceles triangles. Okay? Now, which, which triangle do you know the most information about? The top one or the bottom one? The top one, right? You don't know anything about that bottom triangle. You know no numerical values for that, that bottom triangle. So don't start there. Start in the top one. Draw my attention to the top one. Okay? There's a right angle right here. What does that make this angle right here? 56. Okay? So, starting that top one with that 34, allows you to find that 56. And now, when I cover this one up, I'm done with it. Got a nice last this triangle here. What's this angle right here going to be? 56. That's the isosceles triangle theorem, right? If you've got two sides that are congruent, the angles opposite are congruent. What's the relationship then that you're going to tell me about those two angles right there? They have to 180. They're a linear pair. You want to say 56? 56 plus x plus 138 is equal to 180. Okay, you can go ahead and solve that. Does anybody know what this angle right here would be? What are those add up to? Be careful. That's 112, right? Doesn't this have to be 68? Okay. What is that angle and that angle supposed to add up to? Hmm? It should add up to angle two. Does that make sense, everybody? Is that a remote interior or set of remote interior angles? And that's an exterior angle? Okay. So you could solve your equation that way. Once you find x, okay, I think x ends up being negative 14 here. Okay. That gives me 124 for angle two, right? The 68 plus 56 gives me 124. Yeah. Okay. So you can use one theorem to kind of set up your work and get your answer, and then use an accompanying theorem, the one that is also existing inside your, your picture, to validate that answer. All right. Uh, there's an assignment in Math Excel 4.5, I think. Uh, yeah, 4.5. Uh, do tomorrow. All right. Have a great rest of the day.